Recently, I participated in a Vipassana silent retreat of nine days, and I want to share my experience with you. First of all, obviously, this is a very limited experience. I will tell you uh, how the retreat was organized and what we did, but I don't know how other retreats may be better or worse. Second, the uh, experience I have is starting from zero to whatever insights I may have developed in a 25th century long tradition so certainly it is very limited and uh, very fresh and genuine uh, but still uh, you shouldn't rely on it exclusively however taken all that if you can organize your life so that you can for nine or ten days detach from the modern way of living and dedicate that time to an experience like this, it is highly recommended. Vipassana uh, is a meditation practice developed by Gautama Buddha Siddhartha 2,500 years ago and adopted by what then uh, became the uh, Buddhist tradition and uh, preserved over the course of time um, uh, through word of mouth uh, without having been written down for many, many years. It, the practice uh, wasn't known outside of Tibet, India, um, what uh, we today call Bangladesh and other areas where Buddhism was uh, uh, practiced it, and it gained uh, a wider um, uh, uh, knowledge and, and uh, garnered practitioners uh, about a hundred years ago or started to do so. Uh, um, uh, Tibetan monks after uh, China's uh, invasion of Tibet uh, left uh, together with the Dalai Lama and uh, uh, started uh, talking about uh, their practices uh, in other places. And uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s of uh, the 20th century, uh, the practices um, started to be translated into English and then from English uh, into other languages as well. The original language uh, of the practice is uh, Sanskrit, and um, I am not going to uh, attempt to uh, use the Sanskrit terms uh, too much, uh, as um, I am sure I would butcher them. Uh, but uh, so let me start by telling you what one does, what happens. First of all, you have to take um, a serious decision about investing uh, your willpower uh, because uh, during the silent retreat, you don't talk and you're not talked to. You don't read, you don't write, you don't use your devices or the internet you don't even look each other in the eye the whole setup is to concentrate to purify the mind and through the meditation practice to improve your ability to concentrate and to empty the mind of preoccupations of distractions in this particular retreat, we were about 70 people, a pretty large group, I would say. Uh, 
the vast majority were women and maybe 10 or 12 uh, males. Um, fairly separated, not segregated, uh, but, um, you know, we would uh, eat at the same time, but uh, women would be eating on, on one side and the, and the men on other tables. Uh, the meditation as well, uh, the women on one side and, well, on the other side as well, and then the men. Um, and uh, we uh, were in a, in a kind of a monastery, um, uh, but without uh, the, the monks, uh, just uh, ourselves in silence. The day starts at four o'clock in the morning uh, when you wake up, and then half an hour later, you start with two hours of meditation. Then uh, there is breakfast and then other two one-hour meditation sessions. Then a little break, then another hour or two of uh, meditations. Then uh, at uh, 11 o'clock, there is lunch, then a little rest. Uh, that meal at 11 o'clock is the last meal of the day. At one o'clock, you uh, meditate again for uh, two one-hour sessions, a little break, then another uh, meditation session. Uh, there is tea, or for those who must, a piece of fruit, maybe a watermelon uh, slice, and then um, a, a discourse by the instructors uh, and a final hour of meditation ending at uh, 8.30 and 9 o'clock is lights out and you are supposed to start sleeping. And this is what happens every day uh, for nine days. The meditation itself is um, apparently very simple because you have to sit without moving for one or two hours and uh, you can sit cross-legged on your mat or you can sit on your knees or as it was my case, you can sit in a chair. And when you sit without moving, it is without moving. So you don't move your legs, you don't move your arms, you close your eyes. If um, there is a scratch, you don't scratch it. If uh, there is discomfort or a little cramp, you don't uh, do anything. Now, in at the beginning, you take a kind of an oath of uh, making the best effort of being moral and of being just. And that best effort uh, is a very um, opportune expression of doing your best, but without being sadomasochistic about it without harming yourself. So if one having made their best effort realizes that they cannot um, sit still, they can move if they must, or they can also leave the, the meditation room uh, and uh, just silently uh, let the others uh, keep going. So, Looking from the outside, that's it. A bunch of people sitting in a room in complete silence without moving with their eyes closed for one, two hours. And uh, even this uh, period of time uh, is kind of a compromise in order to uh, understand that uh, our feeble minds uh, couldn't stand more because Theoretically, you should do four hours of meditation, break for a meal, four hours of meditation, break for another meal, four hours of meditation, 
and then start over, right? But uh, no, that uh, is outside of at least my possibility. I, I, I know that. So from the outside, it looks pretty simple. But from the inside, it is, well, not that simple at all. The first three days, you are told to listen to the air as it leaves your nose and hits the base of your nose. And then as you inhale, it comes in. And once again, you listen to the sensation of your breathe hitting the base of your nose. Inhaling, listening to the sensation, exhaling, listening to the sensation. And uh, the instructors, uh, we had uh, two, Eduardo, who founded uh, this uh, association. Uh, he is now 80 years old. Uh, and uh, his uh, assistant, a female instructor, Masha, who will take over the school, uh, they guide you in um, focusing your mind and they tell you if a thought arises, you contemplate it and you let it go. If a physical sensation arises, you contemplate it, you see its uh, structure, you see it uh, transforming, you let it go. And um, you bring your attention back to the breathing and of, to the sensation of the air hitting the base of your nose. It's very interesting that the whole practice is very experiential. This particular meditation of the breathing and the sensation of the air hitting the base of your nose is anapana. So anapana meditation is what goes on for two hours, then one hour, one hour, and so on for three days. And the language of the instructors as they guide you in focusing gets enriched little by little with the concept of uh, uh, the uh, passing uh, of the impermanence of these uh, sensations. Uh, and uh, they, they tell you to uh, realize that the sensations um, are the only way that you no reality, uh, both the outside world as well as the inside world, and that uh, they are this representation of the world rather than the world as it is truly is. But uh, each um, addition to this uh, view, to this uh, way of describing things is um, not presented as a theoretical framework. It is connected every time to a physical effect of your breathing and then later on to uh, your mental states and then later on uh, to your physical sensations in the body, etc. So the meditation is very, very experiential. After three days, without anyone having told you before, you switch to the Vipassana meditation itself, where you realize that this ability to focus um, on, in that case, the breathing and the sensation of the air hitting the base of your nose is nothing but a tool, like a laser 
enabling you to move your attention to a particular place. And you are told to start from the top of your head, going down in the various parts of your body, moving your focus and looking at the feeling, the, the sensations from that particular part of the body um, uh, elicit these feelings, these sensations arising, transforming, and then dissipating. And you go through your whole body from top to bottom over the course of an hour, starting maybe with 20 minutes of anapana focusing, and then 40 minutes of vipassana going through your body. And so that's it. Now, it is hard, right? It is hard to keep the thoughts um, not impacting your ability to focus. It is hard not to move or to scratch. It could happen, as it happened to me, that when the instructor guides you, maybe you are better able, following their voice, to follow the instructions and uh, keep track of what actually you are doing. But when you are on your own, well, I would find myself uh, going through my body maybe 20 minutes after having started, still having to bring back my thoughts or rather my focus, letting the thoughts go to the top of my head or my ear or my mouth or whatever step I was rather than being halfway through or, or uh, in, in other places of the body as I should have been. So it is, it is hard. The rest of what I am going to say is extremely subjective, of course, because the practice and the focusing and the effort that is not a physical effort, even though I was sweating all the time so much at four in the morning with the windows open uh, in the meditation room, um, so pretty chilly, you would think, with nothing but a t-shirt and, and, and shorts on, I would be sweating so much because of, of the concentration and, and, and of the effort. But still, you know, it is not like uh, working out, but uh, the subjective experiences inside are pretty amazing. I will mention just, uh, just a few. So you may have uh, seen other videos that I published about my psychedelic uh, experience with uh, 5-MeO-DMT, um, the extract of the frog of the Sonoma Desert, Bufo alvarius. Uh, which is the most powerful psychedelic uh, known uh, to mankind. Um, that is very, very profound, transformative, um, and also highly recommended. Uh, you are unconscious and it lasts maybe 10 or 15 minutes. However, there are very interesting uh, uh, parallels and similarities to Vipassana. In Vipassana, you are conscious. It lasts hours, but you do develop a deep perception of love as foundation of reality. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me what is the non-metaphysical 
interpretation of that. I am telling you my subjective experience. On top of that, uh, which for me was ever present, your mind uh, opens up to observing, evoking, um, deeply understanding your experiences in a very emotional manner. Um, you can cry. I did, even sobbing, maybe in your room rather than in the meditation room where you would uh, make it harder for others to concentrate. Uh, you can remember things that uh, you thought you forgot. And at least once uh, when uh, I was uh, in my room resting for just uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes between meditation sessions. I had waves of pleasure washing over my brain um, that I can only describe as, as a brain orgasm. Um, well, as a consequence of the meditation, I would say. I don't know what to link it to otherwise. Now, the uh, five, six days of uh, Vipassana after the first three get progressively enriched with little concepts and little words introduced uh, during the guided meditation sessions as well. And as I was telling you about the, the day's structure, uh, I mentioned that there is an hour of uh, teaching where the instructor actually gives um, a, a little more background uh, and uh, you also have the opportunity to ask uh, questions, at least uh, novices uh, like me, uh, not anyone who was uh, in a retreat already before, so just a handful of us would. And um, you are introduced uh, to the concepts of compassion, uh, empathy, suffering as uh, a measure of being um, far from the deep reality of uh, love and uh, the unity of consciousness uh, and other um, components of, uh, of the practice, including uh, karma and uh, nirvana, where karma is basically the balance of uh, your uh, good and bad actions, and uh, nirvana uh, is the state of enlightenment uh, where you realize uh, the fundamental uh, nature of reality uh, as love and its uh, uh, unity uh, across all the universe. Now, the retreat in my case was completely absent of uh, um, religious tones. If you ask the Dalai Lama, he will tell you that no, Buddhism is not a religion. Uh, in terms of it, uh, one, uh, not having a, a, a deity uh, to worship, and two, uh, of uh, not having a dogmatic setup where um, if uh, scientific progress makes certain practices or certain assumptions um, become false, uh, the dogma still survives. Uh, it is very clear that it has to cede its place. But obviously a lot of things that would uh, be shared uh, still had uh, a strong metaphysical component. And this is very, very far from my worldview. 
uh, starting from reincarnation and uh, nirvana and karma and all those things. However, empathy, compassion, love, the benefit of the ability of being able to focus, of not being encumbered by thoughts, um, of not uh, falling into the trap of uh, recrimination or self-recrimination uh, or uh, regrets for things that you cannot change. These are all extremely practical and positive things. So after five, six days of Vipassana meditation, where uh, you are introduced to these uh, things progressively, and you work very, very hard, the last meditation was very interesting for me. Because instead of going through the body, calling out the parts as usual before, the instructor said, feel the bundle of sensations of anicca, Anicca is this concept of the impermanence. So feel the sensations, the bundle of sensations of Anicca, we call shoulder. Feel the bundle of sensations of Anicca, we call arm. And so on. So <laughs> that was a wonderful true red pill because just like in matrix if you accept that kind of interpretation then uh, the uh, reality around you dissipates you don't necessarily see green numbers falling down uh, behind your eyes uh, but um, you are um, well, led to question uh, the validity of your assumptions, of your sensations, and uh, what also you can do about them, how you go about deciding what you can do about them, and so on. After that last meditation, the vow of noble silence is um, suspended or eliminated and the people attending can start talking to each other. So that was, that was amazing because we would only know each other through our steps uh, or the whiff of odor as uh, people pass uh, each other or the gesture of taking a piece of food uh, in the communal table as uh, we would be silently uh, serving and, and eating and we would know nothing of who each other was and what uh, we experienced and uh, what our life was outside of the retreat. So then you pass uh, that evening or even the night and then uh, breakfast the morning after to uh, just know each other a little bit. Wonderful. The recommendation to novices and experienced um, attendees too is to keep meditating one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. I didn't do that, at least not yet. I may, we'll see. So back to the beginning, if you can organize your time uh, so that your family, your work allow you to have these nine, 10 days just for you. It is something I highly recommend. I greatly enjoyed it. Thank you.